before the swallow, before the daffodil, and not much later than the snowdrop, the common toad salutes the coming of spring after his own fashion. Something, some kind of shudder in the earth, or perhaps merely a rise of a few degrees in the temperature, has told him that it is time to wake up. 75 years ago today, my father published his essay, Some Thoughts on the Common Toad, in the left-wing weekly magazine Tribune. It's one of his most characteristic pieces of work, which not only reflects his abiding love of nature, but sets it against the authoritarian forces of left and right, which had the post-war world in their grasp. All these smelly little orthodoxies, as he once put it, which are now contending for ourselves. This is the first spring that there hasn't Britain hasn't been at, in, at war since 1939. Um, it's an essay that's written in an urban environment. Orwell would have written it in his flat in Islington. But its origins go back, I would have said, 35 years, go back to a very early time in Orwell's life. Even when he was at prep school, he was sending letters back to his mother that talk about the natural world. I mean, here's one from 1912. He says he doesn't want to come home and find that all the tadpoles are eaten up by the beasts of leeches. Later on in his life, he's an actual smallholder, a small farmer. Uh, when he is tenant of the stores, Wallington, the village shop in Hertfordshire, which he ran for a year or two in the late 1930s, uh, there was an actual small holding, and uh, he was very interested in goat husbandry, of course the name of hers, in Animal Farm, uh, and took a minutely particularised interest in things like how goats breed. Uh, and then when he fetched up on the, uh, the Inner Hebridean island of Jura in the late 1940s, at the time he was writing, 1984, um, he's very concerned with the flora and fauna of the island. One of the things my father was really very concerned about, uh, uh, about my welfare, of course, was snakes. Now, Jura did have an abundance of adders, which are only mildly uh, venomous, but nevertheless, they, they would probably hurt a little boy. But I do recall... The, the incident itself, vaguely, was we went over one afternoon, uh, stepped out of the boat onto the foreshore, where there was a very large adder. And my father promptly stood on it, stamped on it with his great big size 13 boots, uh, produced a pen knife, and proceeded to fillet this bloody thing from one end to the other, which was an extraordinary thing to do. After his long fast, the toad has a very spiritual look, like a strict Anglo-Catholic towards the end of Lent. His movements are languid but purposeful, his body is shrunken, and by contrast his eyes look abnormally large. A toad has about the most beautiful eye of any living creature. It is like gold, or more exactly it is like the golden-coloured semi-precious stone which one sometimes sees in signet rings. There's something deep down in the or in the compost, if you like, of English life, where Orwell resides, that, that's far away from the 20th century when it was being written and goes deep, deep back into English time or British time, where I think it can be said a lot of Orwell resides. For a few days after getting into the water, the toad concentrates on building up his strength by eating small insects. Presently, he is swirled into his normal size again, and then he goes through a phase of intense sexiness. All he knows at least if he is a male toad, is that he wants to get his arms round something. And if you offer him a stick, or even your finger, he will cling to it with surprising strength and take a long time to discover that it is not a female toad. Frequently, one comes upon shapeless masses of ten or twenty toads rolling over and over in the water, one clinging to another, without distinction of sex. Orwell's friend uh, Tosco Fievel said that um, he tended to let himself go stylistically when he began to conflate the idea of nature with his feelings for women. Uh, in his teens, he had a girlfriend called Jacintha Buddicombe, with whom he roamed the hills above Henley, uh, picking mushrooms and writing not terribly good nature poems to each other. Uh, this all speeds up in the early 1930s when he's living in his parents' house at Southwold and is very friendly with two women called Brenda Southkeld and Eleanor Jakes, both of whom he schemed to marry and both of whom refused him. And Orwell's idea of a come on for an assignation is to write a little note suggesting that they go for a nature ramble. So uh, there's a recently discovered letter to uh, Brenda, which has come up from about 1931. Dearest Brenda, I hope your horrid friends don't come as there are various interesting 
things to do on Sunday. I've marked a place where there should be a shelter attached. There's a very intimate letter uh, to Eleanor Jakes from the 1930s, remembering the afternoon they spent in Blythesborough Woods and your, and your nice white body under the moss. That kind of thing. And all of which I think is then projected through into to, to some of the sort of the nature passages of 1984, 15, 16 years later. Is it wicked to take a pleasure in spring and other seasonal changes? To put it more precisely, is it politically reprehensible while we are all groaning, or at any rate ought to be groaning, under the shackles of the capitalist system to point out that life is frequently more worth living because of a blackbird's song, a yellow elm tree in October, or some other natural phenomenon which does not cost money and does not have what the editors of left-wing newspapers call a class angle. There is no doubt that many people think so. Nature to him is politics, or rather it's, it's politics of the side. It's the kind of thing that is out there, away from the clutch of dictators, away from the clutch of capitalists. Um, it's something that an ordinary person can respond to and is pretty much free to do as he or she likes which, of course, is a reason why it's you know, presumably inimical for the, the people who call the shots either in the 20th, 20th century or in the decades after it. And yet it's an essay that is fully allied to the joys and beauties of the natural world, in which he talks about hearing birdsong in Canonbury Square in just the same way that a few years before, he's the, well as the kind of writer who, walking through central London, can notice a kestrel flying over Lord's cricket ground. That was the kind of observant eye he had for nature even living in central London in the 1940s. At any rate, spring is here, even in London N1, and they can't stop you enjoying it. This is a satisfying reflection. How many a time have I stood watching the toads mating or a pair of hares having a boxing match in the young corn and thought of all the important persons who would stop me enjoying this if they could. But luckily they can't. So long as you are not actually ill, hungry, frightened or immured in a prison or a holiday camp, spring is still spring. The atom bombs are piling up in the factories. The police are prowling through the cities. The lies are streaming from the loudspeakers. But the earth is still going round the sun. And neither the dictators nor the bureaucrats, deeply as they disapprove of the process, are able to prevent it.